Good. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm so honored to be part of this Kensington Connect series. It, it really means a lot to me and I've had so much fun um, putting this together. And um, I'm grateful to Connor for doing all the stuff with the, with the Zoom, for, with questions and with the webcam, webcam and everything. What I thought I'd do is show some slides here of Edith Wharton's biography. And I'm guessing that if you're participating in this, that you've read some of her work or that, or that you've seen some of the films. I started reading her when I was in college and I never stopped. And in the 1990s, it occurred to me, I realized that people were beginning to make films of her books and that hadn't happened since 1939. So I decided to try to figure out why. And the more I read, the more confused I, I became. And I'll explain that in a minute, but a little bit about her, she's very interesting. She was born in New York City um, to very wealthy parents. Her father was, his last name was Jones. Her maiden name is Jones. And in fact, the, the, the thing that we always say, keeping, in, keeping up with the Joneses comes from her family. They owned about half of Manhattan Island and they were very wealthy people. Uh, she was born in 1862, so during the Civil War. She spent most of her childhood in Europe. Like a lot of wealthy Americans in New York, they left the States during the Civil War and lived in Europe until the war was over, then they came back. She was, her mother was, um, almost 40 when she was born and she had two brothers who were teenagers when she was born. So she always felt as if she was raised as an only child. Because of the time she lived, even though she was very bright, she didn't go to college. She would never have been admitted to a university. She was, she, all of her schooling was at home in her father's library. And by the time she was a teenager, she spoke five languages and wrote in five languages. She was very smart. Um, and she, she was a writer and that bothered her mother. Her mother really didn't want her to, her mother wanted her to do what all young women of her class did. They wanted, to, she wanted her to marry well and marry into her own class. Edith had thought, knew she was supposed to do that, but what she did in the meantime was she read every book in her father's library and then she started writing stories. And when she was 14, she wrote a short story called Fast and Loose, which is a title I love. Um, and her mother had it published privately. And I think her mother thought that she'd get it out of her system. She even took paper away from Edith to try to get her to stop writing, but she couldn't stop writing. So this is what she did as a, as a girl. She made up stories. We know this from her own autobiography, which she wrote much later in her life. She did all the things she was supposed to do with her life. She uh, went to dancing school. Her dancing partner was her friend, Theodore Roosevelt. They were the same age and they grew up together and they stayed friends all of their lives, uh, mostly writing back and forth. She came out in society when she was 17. She did all the parties. She did all the stuff she was supposed to do and all of it bored her to tears. She wanted to do something else, of course. She wanted to be a writer. She wanted to be an artist. Uh, but she did like looking at how people behaved. And so she, she did go to all the parties and she paid attention to everything because she was a writer. And like all artists, writers are very particular about overhearing conversations and listening to people. And that's what she did. But she was very uncomfortable. She always felt awkward and out of place. She was a, a redhead and people made fun of her for, for her looks. Um, and she had a lot of trouble trying to fit in, but she did try to fit in when she was a teenager. And just an example, these are the people she hung out with, the Astors and the Vanderbilts. She went to parties at both of their houses. She, she fraternized with all of the, the same people. Some of them she liked, some of them she thought were not very smart and she wanted to be around people that interested her. 
So um, she, her friends, like I said, Theodore Roosevelt was one of the people who she liked a lot. When she was 23, she married. She married Edward Robbins Wharton, who was a guy who had gone to college with one of Wharton, uh, Jones's older brothers. She was 23, he was 35. Um, they were married for 28 years. And what's interesting, when, you, when I start to do research about the two of them, I can only find one photograph of the two of them together. <laughs> I find a million pictures of them sitting with their dogs, but never in the same frame. They're, they're, and the picture of them together, which I don't have up, her mother is sitting between them. Um, they were never a very well-matched couple. He was not interested in many of the things that interested her. He, he also had other issues, which we'll talk about later, but they tried to do the right thing. And she, by the time she married, when she was 23, her father had died and she was closer to her father than her mother. Uh, she didn't get along with her mother very well, but she did do pretty much everything her mother told her to do, including marrying Teddy Wharton. She became very unhappy. She became ill, which happened to a lot of women who married like she did from her social class. Um, it happened to women of any social class. She suffered depression. She was often bedridden. Nobody could quite figure out what was wrong with her. She was probably had chronic depression because she probably hated her life, but she sure did love her dogs. And these are photographs from when in the 1890s when she really didn't feel well and um, she, she tried everything. Only one thing helped and it was writing. When she started writing again, she began to feel better and she became much more energetic and energy makes energy, and that's what she did. Her first book was a book about interior design. It's still on the market today. You can read it. It's really interesting. She wrote it with um, architect Ogden Codman, and he also would be a friend of hers for many years as well. <clears throat> In the 1890s, she also wrote a whole series of short stories for Scribner's Magazine. Magazines were sort of like television for us. They, they, had, they, they had, you know, every month you'd get another installment of a novel. So, or every week, depending on how often they published. And she began publishing all kinds of, all kinds of short stories, which are all really good. And I recommend reading them if you haven't. This was her first novel. I'm sorry, her first collection of short stories. Her first novel took place in Italy, but before that, she and Teddy bought some land in Lenox, Massachusetts, which is in the Berkshires, and some of you may know where this is. And they had uh, her architect friend design this magnificent house for them, which is still there, of course. And now it is, it, it's a little bit, it, they do a lot of weddings there. They've opened it up to the public. My family and I, I dragged them there several years ago, which they were kind enough to do. But now it's been fully furnished. They have bought Horton's original library and all of her books. So you can go and see all her books there too. But they have weddings, they have all kinds of events. It's an event center and before the pandemic, of course. And they had, they also did readings and plays and had people speak there. It, it's a lovely place. And if you're in Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, it's worth going to see. So I hope you do. One of her favorite guests there was her friend, Henry James, who was 20 years older than she was, but, but they hit it off right away. And he read her fiction and encouraged her to keep writing. And her first novel took place in Italy. It's really not a very, not a very good book. And one reason is that she was writing about a place she had only visited. She didn't know very much about it. And James gave her the, the advice, it's very famous advice now, do New York, it, write your novels about where you, about people you know. So she did. <clears throat> her first novel that really put her name on the map was called The House of Mirth. I hope some of you have read it. And I, if you haven't, I hope you will. She was 43 when it was published and it has never been out of print. It's a terrific novel. So I hope, 
I hope you'll read it. We'll talk about it again because it has been adapted to film, but it's a great book. After the House of Mirth, she, this was what she did for the rest of her life, she wrote. This was her calling and she took it seriously. She uh, published all kinds of short stories. She, she published novels. Here's a list of her novels for you to look at to see which ones you've read. The most famous, of course, are The House of Mirth, Ethan Fromm, The Custom of the Country, and um, The Age of Innocence. And that's the one she won the Nobel Prize for. But every one of them is worth reading. They're all good. In uh, 1911, Edith Wharton got a divorce which ostracized her from New York society. Her people who had talked to her before wouldn't talk to her after this. She divorced him. He was bipolar, he was alcoholic, and he was spending her money. He, and the last thing he did before they divorced, he had bought a, an apartment building for his girlfriend in Boston. And one of Edith Wharton's attorneys came to her and said, Teddy just bought an apartment building for so-and-so in Boston. And she said, okay, it's time. So she had to get a divorce from him. And because she was ostracized, she moved to Paris and she lived in France for the rest of her life. She did return to the United States, States once, but she lived in France for the rest of her life. She was very active during the Great War. She spent lots of money helping with orphans and um, children and she worked with the Red Cross. <coughs> Excuse me, for the, she was the first American woman to win a Pulitzer Prize. And she won it for her novel, The Age of Innocence, which is her masterpiece. That's, that's the book that really is good. And it's based on her parents' generation. So it's a historical novel. It's not contemporary to Horton. It is absolutely a labor of love. And if you've not read it, I hope you will. She died in 1937 uh, of a massive stroke. She's buried in the Protestant cemetery in Versailles, which my family, I dragged them there too, so that I could make a, a pilgrimage to see where she's buried. And they came with me and I'm very grateful that they did. This is what she left us, all of this writing, not just fiction, um, novellas, short stories, all of that, but she has a great collection of ghost stories that are good, but she also wrote nonfiction. She wrote travel, travelogues, she wrote literary criticism, she wrote works on architecture and design, and she wrote her, a memoir called A Backward Glance, uh, which is very interesting to read. And that's where I decided I better start looking at the movies made from her books. And what I discovered was she, because she lived half of her life in the age of film, she, I thought, well, maybe she's one of these people who embraced film. And, and in fact, it's the opposite. She said she hated movies. She, and, there, and when writers from this time period, they're either people who embrace film and those include people like uh, James Joyce, or they're people who hate it and like to write about how much they hate it. Virginia Woolf, Edith Wharton. So she hated it. She said it was Hollywood was the worst place in the world, but she would say that. And then the next minute she would sell one of her novels to a Hollywood producer because she could make so much money, especially during the great depression. And so she had this, kind of odd relationship with movies. Uh, what I decided after I did all my research was that it wasn't so much that she didn't like movies, it's that she was afraid of movies. She knew that they could tell stories and they were competition. And the other reason she didn't like Hollywood is, is difficult, but it's true. She was anti-Semitic. She had a real problem with people who were Jewish. And she thought Hollywood, she, she agreed with Henry Ford. She thought that, that the Jewish population of the United States was in control of everything, especially Hollywood, and they were gonna brainwash the rest of us. So she had some issues and scholars don't 
it, it's taking a long time for people to say that out loud, what I just said. They don't want to talk about it, but it's true. It's one reason that she didn't like movies. <clears throat> Unfortunately for her, the movies liked her. And her the film versions of her books have outlived her by far and, and really make her fiction look good. She Her fiction looks better because of the adaptations. These are the seven that are still in existence. There were some silent films, but they have deteriorated. We can't watch them. Um, the, the first one that was actually very good was The Old Maid. And what I thought I'd do is show you a little bit about these movies and I have some clips I can show. You may have seen this, it's on Turner Classic Movies every once in a while. It came out in that great year, 1939. Every good movie you've ever heard of came out in 1939. Uh, the, the Old Maid is a novella. It's wonderful, it's charming. And it was adapted to the stage and the stage play was adapted to film. Edith Wharton died in 1937, so she never saw it. But it turns out it's a terrific movie. What I have to show you is the, um, excuse me, is the clip of the, it's the trailer. Charlotte with a good deed, a haven for destitute children, 20 children to hide one child, his child. That's what hurts you. And if Joe finds out later, after you're married, it tortures you to think what I was to Clem and still have a good marriage, doesn't it? You must tell Joe. He's a Ralston. He'd never forgive me. I'd lose him. Better lose him than deceive a decent man into a respectable marriage, a man you don't even love. Oh, Delia, <laughs> listen to me. I do love Joe. Oh, I'll make him a good wife. He'll never be sorry he married me. You're going to tell him? I can't, Delia. Then I will. She can't marry anyone now. Don't you know what happens to you means more to me than anything? You must. But I'm not worth it, Sean. I think you are. He loved me. He might have let me keep him. But you lied to make sure I wouldn't have him, didn't you? He wanted to see me since. But I refused because I was so ashamed. You're so wicked. Okay, um, one of the things that made this an interesting short story and that made it an interesting movie is that it's about a woman who has a baby out of wedlock and how she negotiates that in society. And of course, if you saw that, she has a cousin who's Miriam Hopkins and she lets Miriam Hopkins character raise her daughter. And so at the end of the film, she wants to tell and the short story, she wants to tell this girl that she is her mother, but her, her daughter, she calls her an old maid. 
So it was made in Hollywood during the years that censorship would have made it sort of difficult, but it's actually a really, really good movie. So I hope if you, if you have access to Turner Classic Movies that you can watch it, you can probably rent it elsewhere as well. Um, the next one I can't get a clip from because Amazon won't let me. They won't let me show you the preview. But this is a 1993 version of Ethan Fromm. And Ethan Fromm is a great novella. Uh, it takes place in the Berkshire Mountains. That, and Horton wrote it because of things she had seen happening when she was at the Mount. It's actually a really fine movie. The director, John Madden, the next film he directed after this was Shakespeare in Love. So he's, this is a, another major motion picture. It has a great cast, Liam Neeson, Patricia Arquette, and Joan Allen play the three in the triangle. If you've never seen it, I hope you will watch it. And especially, I hope you'll read it. And it also takes place it's cold. There's there's a lot of sledding in this one. So it's a good wintertime um, film and it's a great novella. Let's see. In 2000, The House of Mirth. The House of Mirth um, was her first novel. It's the movie that was direct. It's a British European production. It's got a great cast. Everybody in it is good and it's absolutely beautiful. I don't think that it's available to stream. Oh, oh no, I think it's available to stream. I haven't seen it on, on any stations, but I think Amazon, I'm sure you could probably rent it. I do have the trailer for it here. I suppose you're going to Bellamont. For a week. How delicious. I asked him here on purpose for you. Why don't you say it? I have the reputation for being on the hunt for a husband. Isn't marriage your vocation? Isn't it what you're all brought up for? I certainly haven't succeeded. But you will marry someone very rich. I generally get what I want in life. Now all I want is the woman. Miss Lily Bart as Summer by Watto. It is a pity, though, that Lily makes herself so conspicuous. I've never seen you look more lovely. You're rather a responsibility in such a scandalous place after midnight. He wouldn't stay with her 10 minutes if he knew. Knew? If he had positive proof. I have something you might like to see. I have no idea why you have brought these letters. To sell them. A clever woman would know just when to play her cards right. But Lily's never been very clever in that way. You cannot want this! I need your help. The only way I can help you is by loving you. Well, that isn't playing fair, Lily. You're dodging the rules of the game, and now you've got to pay. I will be disgraced. I consider that you are disgraced. Husbands are expected to be like money, influential but silent. I know that there have been times when you've been worried. A married man should not have the burden of being seen alone with a single woman. If you wish to keep your reputation intact, tell him nothing. Talk about love making people jealous. It's nothing to social ambition. Why is it that when we meet, we always play this elaborate game? It's a wonderful movie. So, and an even better novel, of course. So here's another. And finally, the best of them is the 1993 Age of Innocence, directed by Martin Scorsese. It was on Turner Classic Movies in its complete criterion re restoration on Valentine's Day. So it's on every once in a while. It's also on other stations as well sometimes, and I know you can rent it. Um, it has a great cast. It is absolutely beautiful. It won two Academy Awards for costuming and for theater set design, I believe. And it has a beautiful soundtrack uh, by 
the great composer Elmer Bernstein, the other Bernstein, I like to call him. But here's the here's the trailer for The Age of Innocence. I want you to talk to me about May. Are you very much in love with her? As much as a man can be. Do you think there's a limit? In a time of tradition. In a place of privilege. Newland Archer lived his life by the rules of his society. I want everybody to know. What? That we're engaged. <laughs> Until he met a woman who lived by her own rules. I think they're all a little angry with me for setting up for myself. I hear she means to get a divorce. She made an awful marriage, but that doesn't make her an outcast. I came to see what you were running away from. All I really want is to feel cared for and safe. Is there someone else? We should remember marriage is marriage and Ellen is still a wife. When can I see you? I can't be your wife, Newland. Is it your idea I should live with you as your mistress? You gave me my first glimpse of a real life. And then you asked me to carry on with a false one. No one can endure that. I'm enduring it. Everybody knows. Have you considered the consequences? What the hell does that mean, sir? From the Pulitzer Prize winning novel. Shall I come to you? Come to me. Columbia Pictures is proud to present Daniel Day Lewis, Michelle Pfeiffer, Winona Ryder. They never knew what it meant to be tempted, but you did. <laughs> the Age of Innocence, the Martin Scorsese picture. So I hope you'll watch this if you haven't, and if you have, I hope you'll watch it again. So, Here's some, some reading, more reading you can do. <laughs> One of them is a book I wrote about all of this, and I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. The other is a wonderful biography of Edith Wharton, which was published the same year as my book was published, only this one won the National Book Award. It's a great biography of Edith Wharton by Hermione Lee. And if you're interested in her life or any of the things that I suggested here, She's a good place to start. Um, let's see, I think I put, this is the table of contents in my book. What I did is I talked about her, during her lifetime, her relationship to film. And it, it was an uneasy relationship. Although movies show up in all of her fiction. When she writes fiction, sometimes her characters are movie stars or sometimes they're people who are going to the movies. So she, it was, movies were embedded in her, in her fiction. The second part has to do with the adaptations of her fiction and what happens to her work when it is adapted to the screen. And what happens is it proves what a great writer she was. Um, some films can be, some, some fiction can be adapted easily and some take a lot of effort. And the ones that take a lot of effort are usually the better novels. And her, it, it shows how complicated and wonderful her, her, book, her books are, her stories are. They're all, they're all worth reading and they're all worth watching. So I hope you will um, see all of them. And I just put this up because it's one of the quotations of hers that I love. That's all. And also, this is one of the only photographs of her where she's smiling. And she didn't like to smile for camera. She didn't like cameras very much. Too bad. But I love that that she had that we have this picture of her. So that's that's my entire um, presentation. And I'd love to take questions, or I'd love to see you on your screen, maybe. Um, so we've got some questions, and unfortunately, we can't see, enable the 
the photos or the pictures of everybody. Oh, okay. I, I will read some questions. So one attendee was asking, would she have been friends with Eleanor Roosevelt or was Edith older? I don't think she knew Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, she lived in France for her whole, for most of her adult life. Mm. Um, she probably had met her because Eleanor Roosevelt was Theodore Roosevelt's niece. And so they knew each other probably, but I don't, she was older than, than um, Eleanor Roosevelt. And I don't think they, they knew each other very well. Yeah, and- Oh yeah, go ahead. No. Who was the second person? Yep. So there's a, a couple more questions. How okay. accurate, how accurate have film adaptations been and who owns the rights to her works today? Most of her works are the rights are owned by Yale University, which is where all of her books and all of her papers, most of them are. Um, a lot of some of them are are in in the public domain though, a lot of the work that she did. Um, and what was the rest of that question? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. How accurate, how accurate has the well, film adaptations been? You know, film adaptation is it accurate. How faithful is it to the original, to the original novel? Is is I think what you're asking. Um, some some are more faithful than others, but adapting film is like translating from one language to another. When you translate one art form into another art form, you have to you have to negotiate it. It's never going to be the same, and so it's it's complicated. But most filmmakers have been very sensitive to her writing and to her her works, uh, and and they're they are faithful to the spirit of Wharton. Usually the plot, but not always. And, and it just depends. Film is a different art form. So it, it, it depends on the story and the director. That's a, a lame answer. I like <laughs> that. That's a great answer. Um, Iris was wondering, when did she know artists as she was, you know, spending time in France? Was she friends with any famous artists? She was, fam she was friends with all sorts of people. Um, besides writers. She knew a lot of writers and she liked them. And one of her favorite writers was Proust. She loved Proust, but she knew a lot of painters. Um, she loved music. She, she, she knew all kinds of musicians. Uh, and in France, she did not like modern art very much. And most of the modern artists that you can think of from the time period in France were younger than she was. And she probably didn't run in their circles. She was much more traditional than that. We had a couple comments. Um, we had, this was fascinating. Thank you very much. Oh. And then Estella just asked, uh, she must have had a lot of money when she died. Did she donate it? Uh, did she have any family who inherited any of her belongings? She had one niece who was a landscape architect. She was kind of a famous person actually who inherited everything. Um, and, but she also designated two of her friends to be the people who dealt with her manuscripts and her books. Um, most of her personal belongings went to her niece, but the Edith Wharton Foundation at the Mount is trying to buy a lot of them back now. And um, I hope they do. They got her library, they got all of her books. So they're trying to, to get other, other furniture and things that she had. Her letters and documents are mostly housed at Yale and Indiana University is the other place where they are. Another question, is there a gift shop or a museum? There is, at, at the Mount, there is a gift shop, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then your sister's wondering if you designed your beautiful collar that you have, because that is gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. No, I bought it at Macy's. Okay. And your sister's also wondering what's your favorite book and your favorite movie? I'm sure you have plenty, but maybe right now. Of, of Edith Wharton's? Uh, she didn't specify. Oh, well, I have a cluster of movies that I love. Uh, the Age of Innocence is one of them, but I have so many movies and books that I love. It would take me another day to tell you what they were. <laughs> well, thank you so much, oh. Anne. Let's see if we have any other. Your son said, good job, mom. 
mom. So oh, just make sure that gets thank, read. thank you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and which is your favorite of Borton's book? Oh, I have too many. Uh, Age of Innocence, The Children, The Old Maid, The House of Mirth, I could go on. I, I can't pick one. I love all of them. Well, we want to thank you so much for this lovely presentation today. You're really an expert. And I think we had a lot of big fans of Wharton and yours out in the crowd. Thank and I did you. want to share, I have your beautiful book right here with me. It's a lovely pink for February. And I've got, oh, there it is. <laughs> and I have got 10 of these that we have signed. So I will be picking 10 folks from the audience today and I'll be mailing those out to you. But Anne, thank you so, so much for your time today um, and your expertise. We really enjoyed having you and hopefully we'll see you again in the future. Yes, I hope so. I would like that. I see this one last question. Oh, yeah. What do you think about the controversy surrounding the ending of House of Mirth? I'm not exactly sure, but I'm gonna guess it's the controversy about whether she meant to die or not. Um, I yes. don't know. I don't know what I think. I, I think it every time I read it, I change my mind about what I think. Ah, yeah, that's and art. I'd love to talk to you about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Ira says, wonderful presentation, very historical and informative. Thanks for touching my brain. <laughs> oh, thank you. You all you all have no idea how much fun this was for me. Thank you. You did this Good. Was thank enriching you so to me. Thanks. All right. Have a great day and be safe. Thank you. You Bye too. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Stay warm. Thank you.